I'm ready for I'm ready for some wiggle balls for it's right. Let's get some it's tired. Yeah. Softball. Soft. Are they also over summer? Yeah. Sometimes we end up doing You're like nobody make all stars, nobody makes all stars. I know my oldest is like put in her interest for all stars. So we'll see. <laughs> you were crying with this presentation. I must in it. Right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. like say anything first or sure. Yeah. I don't know if have any announcements or all right, uh good morning. Uh, I'm handing around the attendance sheet, and then I put a reminder up here. Don't forget that that second homework assignment is due by tonight on Canvas. If you don't make that deadline, you can email it to me. So remember, it is 10% off. Okay, so try and make the deadline, but if you miss it, you can still turn it in. And then today we have a guest speaker, as I told you, so I'm going to hand the floor over to her here in a second. Uh, but please answer and ask questions. Take notes uh, and pay attention. And then when I see you on Monday, we'll kind of wrap up. The unit on pregnancy and then we'll do a few more things <laughs> STIs uh from there. So they are all yours and all your Yay, awesome. All right. Hello everyone. How's it going? Good, good, good. Well, I'm super excited to be here with all of you today. I'm sure I've seen some of you out and about on campus. Maybe you've seen me. Um, my name's Jasmine, and I'm the health educator here for the Moore Park College Student Health Center. Um, so I'm often out there kind of doing outreach and different events. Who knows where the Student Health Center is or what services we offer? All right, I'll take it. Like, almost half um so i'll share more about our services and i'll show you our website at the end um but we are located actually just right across the way in the admin building if you walk up those stairs we're that first room to the left and students get access to free medical care and mental health through the student health center so today we're going to talk about sexual health um and stis uh most of our students qualify for free STI testing, free sexual health, free wellness exams, all of that. So we can cover that. If you have questions, let me know. I also brought some of our service cards. I'll hand that out at the end. Um, but yeah, I'm excited. I have like a presentation and everything, but I'm pretty like informal in terms if there's something you want to talk about more or you have a question or you want to stop me, um, just go ahead. Or if we need to pivot on anything, we can do that. And then if I don't know the answer, I will find out the answer and get back to you with it. But um, like I said, any questions, let me know. Okay, make sure I get this. All right, so I just wanted to like do a little disclaimer here before we get into the presentation. Um, a lot of times I think there's a lot of stigma around sexual health, all of that. So I've tried to keep this presentation as like bright and happy and colorful as possible. It's still a serious topic. Um, and then also when talking about things, I know that not everyone's sexually active or interested in being sexually active. So again, there's just a lot of information here. And I know that applies to everybody in different ways. Um, we'll try to have some fun with it. But again, it is a serious topic and we will cover as much as we can. Okay, so first off, the I just wanted to give like a formal definition from the World Health Organization. So the WHO defines sexual health as a state of physical, mental, and social well-being in relation to sexuality. It requires a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships, as well as the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. So that's kind of like the formal definition we'll be working with today, um, and then we'll cover some different things in, in, throughout the presentation and kind of end on STIs and barrier methods. Um, but I just kind of also wanted to point out that, again, sexuality, sex, gender, all of that play into sexual health, um, sexuality and gender on a spectrum. This is presentations intended to be as inclusive as possible. But a lot of times when we talk about sexual health, there's a lot of reference to kind of anatomical anatomy. And so I'm just be mindful of that, that I know it doesn't apply to everybody the same. 
And that also culture and beliefs and our background, all of that kind of plays into how we feel about sexual health. And so that we just want to be respectful of everyone in this space and know that everyone comes at a different kind of like place with sexual health and what they feel about it. So before I get going on my part, I just want to know from all of you, what has learning about sexual health looked like in the past for you? Did you feel like anything was missing? What did you like or not like? Maybe like, where did you learn about it? Was it like school or, you know, things like that? What do we think? What has it been like in the past for you? Basically, like all my sexual health knowledge on the internet. Yeah. Uh, well, my parents never had the thoughts of pain. Yeah. Um, by the time that they maybe would have, yeah. I already was yeah. in the know. You're like, all right, cool. <laughs> Thanks for that. Awesome. Okay, so internet, that's a super common or popular one, like internet shows, things like that. Anyone else? And you have this typical like school setting. Some people know. How was this school setting for anyone who had it? Yeah. Yeah, and that is like a big thing. I have another presentation that's less focused on STIs, but talks about like when you look across the nation, even laws on what has to be taught or like absence only approach, it's so different state by state and school by school. And like back when I had it in school, it was pretty much like that. Like, yeah, if you have sex, you die, unless you're married, then it's fine. <laughs> so that was kind of like the general theme of sexual health. Anyone else? Any other? Yeah. Um, I remember in like third grade, they put all the girls mm. away separately to talk about like periods. Yeah. Like yeah. I remember um, they gave us like a bag with like tampons and pads and like the pamphlet. And then we went out and all the boys were like, well, what is that? Like, yeah. Why did you get yeah. That? And then we had another one with the boys and the girls about like, sexual health and stuff like that in the fifth grade. Okay. But it was, like, not very, like, in-depth. Yeah. For, like, 10. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I specifically remember, like, everyone just being in, like, a portable and all, like, yeah you're like it's it's that day today's the day like I needed a consent form for this like the anticipation of time okay um was anything so that sounds like some too like a lot of times that's pretty typical there's a lot of kind of like separation is kind of this binary gender like everybody doesn't know about everything else um anything else missing or anything else we wish we knew more about in general no 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 yeah wish um learn more about communities yeah like yeah yeah that part is like not really covered at all <laughs> um a lot of, again i haven't done this in a minute but you know like taking a class in high school or something like that but yeah that's a big one communication and i'll share resources with that too that we have there's this uh on our website there's a link to this really great TEDx talk that talks about that and talks about kind of like consent, even just starting at a young age and what that looks like um, and navigating those conversations. So thank you. That's super helpful. I will try to like work that in and keep that in mind as we go through this. Uh, but today we're going to talk about STIs talk about safer sex practices. STIs aren't always everyone's favorite thing to talk about. I know too, in general, it's like a lot of like look at this horrible picture and then like this like hor horribly scary thing. So we're going to try not to look at it like that. But again, I was asked to be here today to talk about STIs. So I have to include some pictures <laughs> um, and some things. And then we're going to talk about safer sex practices and ways to kind of help protect against STIs potentially. Okay, so the interesting thing is like a lot of times, again, when we learn about STIs, it's all these like really graphic images and those are they're real right but 80 percent of people who have an sti don't show any symptoms so if you talk to people like that either do sti screening like in their job things like that a lot of times it's like caught just from routine screening it's not necessarily like these symptoms that always show up um and then someone gets tested so just really kind of keep that in mind as we talk about when and why to screen um and then the most common stis among college students are HPV, chlamydia, and herpes. So there's other types, of course, people can get, but amongst the general college population, these three are the most popular. So we're going to start with chlamydia. <laughs> Let's get right into it. 
So chlamydia is spread through vaginal, anal, and oral sex. Um, the infection is carried in semen, pre-ejaculation fluid, and vaginal fluids. Um, and so it can actually infect the penis, vagina, cervix, anus, urethra, eyes, and throat. So that's something too, a lot of times, I think because conversations are very limited in terms of sexual activities, people don't know that a lot of STIs aren't just necessarily um, isolated to the genital region potentially. Um, and so the concern with chlamydia often is that if it's left untreated, it can lead to infertility. Pictures. <laughs> um, what are some of the symptoms of chlamydia? So again, a lot of times there's no symptoms. Um, it you some people do have burning with your burning with urination or pain with sex. They may have discharge, especially discharge that's maybe like an abnormal color or bleeding between periods. But again, it often goes unnoticed because symptoms can be kind of like vague or absent, or people can sometimes like convince themselves like, oh, that's like normal-ish or something like that. So um a lot of times symptoms kind of go unnoticed. So to test for chlamydia, the most common is really like urine testing that can be done, you know, like routine and fairly easily. Um, if someone's already getting a pap test, they can test for chlamydia at the same time. And then depending on what type of sexual activity someone engages in, they might do site testing. So that could be oral, rectal, or genital. And then Treatment would be antibiotics and then to test and treat any partners. So that's a big thing with STIs is like you also want to be able to test and treat any potential partners to make sure that we're kind of mitigating spread. All right, any questions on chlamydia? Ready to move on to HPV? All right. So HPV, human papillomavirus, who's heard of this before? I feel like this one's on the most commercials, like the most things out there right now, right? Um, so, and that's been a really good thing. The commercials have kind of brought a lot of attention to it, but there's more than 200 types of HPV viruses. Um, and so about 40, 40 different strains infect the genital region. Um, so it's not that all types of HPV are necessarily like impacting the genital region, um, but these kind, the ones that do have that effect, can be spread through really any sexual contact. So again, it's not just like penis, vagina. It can impact the rectum, the anus, the scrotum. Um, there are other types of HPV, so like ones that cause warts on the hands or the feet, things like that. Those aren't the same type of sexually transmitted HPV virus. And the most common two types that cause genital warts are type six and 11. So it's a lot of information on the types and strains of virus. I will not be testing you on that, but it's just kind of good knowledge to know. Um, it's like a very angry air conditioner. Oh, I know. <laughs> I think it's like a long one. It does not want to learn about HPV. Um, that's okay. I've got a loud voice. I'll just be like forced by the end, but it's good. Um, so yeah, so the two types that are most common are type 6 and 11 that cause genital warts. But there's 12 types that can lead to potentially cancer. Um, the most common types that are associated with cancer and often, again, cervical cancer, there's also anal cancer, throat cancer, are types 16 and 18. And cervical cancer is most commonly linked to HPV. So essentially all like cervical cancers are linked back to HPV. Um, but that, again, it can also cause vulva, vagina, penis, mouth, and throat cancer. So this is why in the commercials, a lot of times they go like now, like it'll be like Gardasil, right? Like now it treats against this strain and this strain and da, 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 da. So that's just kind of explaining the typical breakdown of that. It's super, super common. There was one source that said essentially like everyone who's sexually active at some point will get HPV, but most, a lot of times people clear that virus on their own. There's about 43 million infections in 2018. Um, and it's easily spread from skin to skin contact. So this is again where some STIs you have through like genital fluids, things like that. HPV can be spread through skin to skin contact. Um, and so that often happens during sexual intercourse and it can be spread outside again into other areas. 
Okay, symptoms. Again, a lot of people don't have symptoms, which is why routine screening is recommended. Um, a lot of people don't know they have the infection. One of the most common ways is for people who get pap tests, if an abnormal pap comes back, um, who knows what age pap test should start at for people with the cervix? Yeah, 21, yeah. So pap test should start at age 21 and people can get tested at the same time for HPV then. Um, and then sometimes people have symptoms of warts. They can just be little small flesh colored raised bumps. Sometimes it's just a single wart and people maybe mistake it for like an ingrown hair or a pimple or something like that. Sometimes they're not painful at all or they'll go away. So testing um, is common to do a pap test. Sometimes you can also kind of get diagnosed off visualization. So if someone does have warts, someone may say like, yeah, that's HPV. There's currently no approved test for men or people with a penis. So again, going back to conversations, if you're having conversations about like STI testing, just know that that's not something that there's like an FDA approved test for, for that population. We do PAP tests at the Student Health Center. So if you have any questions, feel free to call. And then the cool thing with treatment is, is vaccination has been one of the most successful interventions for reducing HPV. So we've seen a huge drop in HPV infections since 2006 when like that first round of vaccines came out. So we saw about an 88% drop among teen girls. Now we're seeing that that's available for like all genders. Um, and that's really great. There's no technical like cure or treatment for the virus itself. However, um, they can do procedures that can help like minimize spread, things like that. So if someone gets a pap test and maybe they find that HPV is starting to cause like precancerous cells, things like that, they can take care of that early on. They can also remove genital warts. So it's common to like cryo freeze them off. So they really just put like liquid nitrogen, it freezes it, it falls off, or they can scrape it off. All right, HPV was a lot. Any questions? Ready to move on to herpes? All right, herpes is super common, another super common one. Um, there's technically really the thing to take away from herpes here is there's two types. There's HSV-1 and HSV-2. HSV-1 is like what we know often is like oral herpes, um, super common, like 70% of people have it. That's what causes like cold sores, things like that. Um, that's often like sometimes you get that as a kid from like a parent that has it or sharing food or cups or whatever. So that's like a very common type. And then HSV2 is what we know as genital herpes. But the thing is that like they are interchangeable. So you can get genital herpes in the oral region and you can spread oral herpes to the genital region. Um, so that's just something to know and keep in mind. It's two different strains of virus but they are able to transmit in different areas. It's spread from skin to skin contact. And so really it's spread when having vaginal, anal, or oral sex with someone who has the infection. So you can get herpes if you come in contact with a herpes sore from saliva with a with someone who potentially has like oral herpes, genital fluid, or any of the other kind of methods of interchanging that, especially when someone has like an active outbreak. Again, some people have no symptoms or they, I keep pointing like it's gonna be centered on the screen here and it's like over here. <laughs> Um, some people have no symptoms or they rarely have symptoms. So herpes often works kind of like in an outbreak way. So sometimes someone can have an outbreak, not have one again for years and years and years. Sometimes it's more common for people, um, but they may notice like itchy or painful blisters. Um, those blisters can break and kind of turn into sores. And then it can look like other skin things too. Cause again, if it's just kind of like minimal and you're not really noticing it, Sometimes it can look like acne or contact dermatitis or like ingrown hair, things like that. So it, but it can kind of look like these little blisters and then those turn into sores. Symptoms, 
we kind of cover that. Some people have no symptoms. It's really hard to find pictures, and I get blocked so much when I'm searching on our internet here. <laughs> um, but some people have burning with urination, and that's usually just because if there's like an open sore, the when the urine hits it, that can hurt. Um, they might have trouble peeing if there's like swelling from the sores or pain around the area. Sometimes people like before an outbreak might get kind of swollen glands or like swollen uh, like your lymph nodes or like even in the pelvic area or the throat or like your axial underarm region or a fever or a headache or they might feel tired and achy. So those are just some potential symptoms. And then you can do visual to diagnose herpes, you can culture the sore, and you can also do blood work. So someone can get blood drawn, and it can show the viral load if it's present. So although there's no cure for herpes, there is a lot of medications that can help reduce, like, breakouts or also reduce the time of breakouts or the slight severity of them. And there's also ointments that can make the sores, like, heal faster and hurt less. So Although not curable, it is treatable, and there's medications and antivirals to help kind of control that. All right, gonorrhea. I promise this is one of the almost last ones. Um, gonorrhea is an STD. It can cause infections in the genital, rectum, and throat region. It's very common, especially among those age 15 to 24 years old. If anyone remembers, like a few years ago, Ventura County kind of had like a a big gonorrhea outbreak and there were like signs and you know about like getting tested and this and that with gonorrhea again and, and all any of the ones that can be treated with antibiotics sometimes we'll talk about this in the treatment stage but um the first antibiotic may not work and so it's just also important to make sure that you get treated if you need a second antibiotic because it might be like a different strain or something like that um, but symptoms, again, you can have no symptoms. Some people have, so the top one, in case it's hard to see, that's oral gonorrhea. So it causes like white pouches on the mouth. Um, and then the other ones, again, pain or painful or burning sensation with pee. Some people have increased vaginal discharge, vaginal bleeding between periods, um, or white, yellow, or green discharge from the penis. Some may have painful or swollen testicles. Not super common, but can be a thing. Discharge, anal itching, soreness, bleeding, painful bowel movements. Cool. Okay. Testing. Urine testing, or again, depending on the type of sexual activity people have, they may want to do like a swab on a location specifically. It's also really important to like have those conversations with your healthcare provider to make sure that you are getting tested in the right way. It is treatable with antibiotics. There are some drug resistant strains of gonorrhea. Um, and that's why, again, making sure that you are treated and, and that all your symptoms reside or if, ooh, that's why I did. <laughs> or if you don't, or if you need um, a second round, potentially things like that. So always return to a healthcare provider if symptoms do not start improving within a few days. All right. HIV or human immunodeficiency virus. So another one that a lot of people kind of know about, but there is a lot of misconception with this that like, um, I talked to a student once that said like during their school education, they were told that HIV is like only transmittable in men who have sex with men. So that is not true <laughs> um, at all. But approximately 1.2 million people in the U.S. have HIV, and about 13% don't know that they have it and need testing. Um, it does impact certain populations more than others, so we do see kind of higher rates in certain ethnic minority groups, gay and bisexual men, and other men who have sex with men. Um, and there's approximately almost 35,000 new infections in the United States in 2019. Sorry, COVID slowed down some of the data updates. So it was like a couple years of less data. But in 2020, um, men who had sex with men accounted for 71% of new infections. And about 22% were acquired through heterosexual contact. Um, and then in 2019, among females, the largest percentage of HIV infections 
was through heterosexual contact, so 83%. Um, but good news, we are seeing like a reduction in this, and we'll talk about this at the end. A lot of that is due to better kind of public health support and things like that. We also have PEP and PrEP, but there was a about a one-third reduction in new infections from 2015 to 2019, so that is great. So for HIV, there's different symptoms and stages. So the first stage can be just like flu-like symptoms, generally not feeling well. Um, that can lead to stage two, where they may have these symptoms for long, like longer periods of time or chronic HIV infection. And then without HIV treatment, people could stay in this stage for 10 or 15 years. So some people don't really progress to stage three rapidly. And then also like the disclaimer is like now we have so many great antiviral medications that like you can essentially get to undetectable. So it's not like necessarily this progression like they tend to kind of show um, in looking at STI progression. And then in stage three, this can weaken the body's immune system. And this is what we know as AIDS or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. And this can cause um, a specific type of like pneumonia, certain sores, swelling, and some other symptoms along with that. There's different types of testing. So HIV is something where you can do like rapid testing for. So it takes like 20 minutes. There's antibody testing. And so this is... Um, most rapid tests use this, and it's the only HIV self-test approved by the FDA. And then in general, antibody tests use blood, and it can be done from like a little finger poke or oral fluid. And again, it's like a 20 to 40 minute wait time usually for that. And then there's also antigen or antibody testing. Um, this is like a lab test. So this is where they draw blood, and they run like your antigen or antibody level. They do have a rapid test available for this, but again, the antibody test was the FDA approved one. And then they have nucleic acid tests or NAT, and that's gonna look for the virus in the blood. And so this might be where someone's trying to look for the viral load and things like that. Treatment. So again, there's like, if someone tests positive for HIV, there's antiretroviral therapy or ART. Um, and that works to control the virus. So the thing is kind of U equals U. Has anyone ever heard that campaign? Okay, so that's undetectable equals untransmittable. So if someone is on antiretroviral therapy, their viral load can essentially get to where the virus is no longer detected. So it's something where um, if they can't detect the virus, that they also say like you can't transmit the virus. There's also PEP and PrEP. Has anyone heard of these? Machine commercials for them? Yeah. So we have pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis. So people who maybe are at higher risk of HIV and they've decided, they've discussed with their healthcare provider that they want to take like extra precaution, they can take PrEP and that can help pre like prevent the transmission of HIV. Or if someone maybe like has an encounter and they go like, oh, I don't think I was protected, or they find out maybe someone was HIV positive, there's a certain window of time they can take PEP and that's post-exposure prophylaxis to help prevent the transmission of the virus. Okay, don't worry, I'm done with all the major pictures and everything. There's just some other STIs. Unfortunately, we just don't have enough time to cover all of them. But just know those aren't the only STIs out there in the world. Um, there's other ones as well. Okay, this is a quick knowledge check. Which STIs are the non-curable ones? Who can help out, make a list, yeah. Well done. give you a hint they all, yeah HIV. hiv can we get one more they all start with an h yeah HIV. Woo yeah so and then the one i didn't cover which is why i didn't make you say this hepatitis um certain trains of hepatitis especially hep c can be transmitted through sexual activity but yes the four h's are the ones that are technically not curable but are treatable so you know in case you just need like a little bit of fun trivia it's friday night you can definitely push your friends this is what i'm thinking would work okay quick sip of water then we'll talk about safer sex practices all right 
So again, there's a lot of different like ways to protect yourself and what works for you if you're sexually active. Um, one of the kind of places people tend to start is talking about if contraception is needed. There's a lot of different types of contraception. So I've got this like chart here um, and it's two pages of charts. But the thing to know with contraception is if you're using contraception to prevent the risk of pregnancy, not all contraception is an STI protectant. So someone may want to protect themselves against the risk of pregnancy, but just know that you may also need STI protection as well. There's a lot of options, everything from like sterilization, which is considered like a permanent <laughs> method of contraception to injectables. There's rings, patches, birth control, diaphragm, and then all of them have like different essential like statistical risk for pregnancy. And there's, oh, where'd my page go? There we go. Um, this is page two of the long chart. Um, so the ones that I wanna point attention to is technically an internal or external condom, which we're gonna talk about, provides STI protection if you are looking for STI protection and contraception. Um, withdraw has like the, one of the highest kind of risks for pregnancy. So um, it's only about 80% effective. Sponge, spermicide, and then also fertility awareness are also methods that people use. Do, do, do. We're going to really, because we're focusing on STIs today, we're going to really talk about barrier methods because of what they can add for STI protection. Um, and we're going to talk about barrier methods that have to do with penetration, sex toys, hand penetration, oral sex, and genital stimulations. So the primary ones we'll cover are internal condoms, external condoms, and dental dams. Woohoo! Okay, so we're just going to go through like a bunch of different types and ways to protect yourself. So if you're doing hand stuff, any hand stuff, it's a good idea to wash your hands. You don't want to like introduce bacteria or germs if you don't need to. So wash your hands, have clean hands, clean under your nails. Um, and then kind of the recommendation for reducing the risk of STI is to not like mix hands if you're touching someone else and then going to touch yourself. And the reason is, is if you're touching someone else and you get potential like body fluid, things like that, and then you touch yourself, that's really where the risk comes in for any potential STI transmission. Also, just a tip is like be nail mindful if you are doing anything that could irritate the walls of the vagina. Um, some people really do want to feel really safe with that. And so there's actually like finger condoms, which are like little, like sometimes you see them actually in restaurants because if people have a cut, they'll put on like these little finger condoms. But you can use that or a glove. Um, and then also because exposed hands can increase pH imbalances or yeast infections, but using lube can also help reduce like friction or risks of tearing or anything like that. Overall though, the risk of passing an STI is relatively low. Like I said, the one thing that like you need to be mindful of is like touching yourself and someone else or someone else and yourself. That's really where the risk comes in. In all the studies for this, HPV has been found underneath the nails of people. So that's like a potential risk. And then gonorrhea has also been shown to be a potential risk, but again, overall relatively low risk. Oral sex. So every couple of years, we do the National College Health Assessment here at Moore Park. So you may get an invite to do that, or maybe you have done it. And we also appreciate when you do. Um, so here at our campus, I always like to share statistics. So over 55% of our students report having oral sex, 30% in the last two weeks, but 90% report that they have not or do not use a barrier method for oral sex in the past month. Oral sex, like I will say that essentially you can transmit any STI the same as penetration. So how can you protect yourself potentially? So if performing oral sex on a penis, you can use a condom. Some people like to use flavored condoms for this. Flavored condoms are totally fine for oral sex as long as someone has like an allergy or anything like that to it, but they're not recommended for vaginal sex. Does anyone know why? Yeah. Yeah, so it can cause like pH imbalance, irritation, things like that. So if you use flavored condoms, just use them for oral sex, not for vaginal penetration. 
Other methods of protecting yourself, dental dams. Um, has anyone seen a dental dam before? Yeah, I've, I mean, hopefully I've been out in the quad with them like all the time. So, um, so they come in little packages like this. They're super hard to find. I had to buy some for an event and I literally couldn't find like a store that had them in stock. Um, luckily I found someone that does like quick shipping on dental dams, which was great. Um, so they're really hard to find, but the good news is we do have them at the student health center. So if that is something you want, I'm looking for my dental dam, I got lost. There it is. <laughs> um, you can all stop by and get it. This one's been through a few classes, so it's a little wrinkled, but essentially pull out a nice one. And it's basically just a long, big sheet of plastic. Um, and so you would just put that either between the vagina, anus, wherever you're performing oral sex, and it creates like a good barrier method. These are flavored. This is vanilla. Um, if you don't have access to a dental dam and you want to use that, you can make your own. So you can DIY a dental dam out of a condom. So maybe you have a flavored condom and you want to practice and try that out. So a condom is about 36 cents or free. Like you can find them almost a bunch of places for free. Um, so all you do is you just cut the tip off and then you cut down the side and then you have a less pretty square that still works and does the job. Some people also use saran wrap as long as it's non-microwavable like we say that's fine it's better than nothing um but technically saran wrap is not fda approved so just keep that in mind <laughs> but people get like the holiday print the colors like you can really get into it with the saran wrap okay and then some people who maybe have started to transition and might be on testosterone um the clitoris may enlarge and they may have a hard time finding like an appropriate barrier method to cover it. So one thing is what uh, that's a potential option is a cape. And you basically take like a medical grade glove and you cut out the fingers and then you cut down the side and then you would slip the T penis or the clitoris into like the thumb and then the rest acts as a barrier method. So barrier methods aren't like for oral sex aren't always 100% effective. Also, because like some STIs are spread skin to skin, you're not just covering everything, but it does offer protection. And then again, like essentially every STI can be passed through oral sex. So there might not be certain risks that we think about with sexual activity, but there is still a risk of STI. Um, chlamydia, gonorrhea, HPV, herpes, syphilis, HIV, all of that. And they're quite common. We already covered herpes. We don't need to cover that again. Yeah, so just remember, STIs can be passed through oral sex. Get excited. Okay, if you're using toys for things, the biggest risk, again, it's similar to kind of like hand stuff, is like sharing a toy or not properly cleaning a toy. So if you plan on switching partners and using the same toy, um, it's really important to clean it. Usually it's recommended, like there's instructions on what's recommended to be used on it, but use soap and water. Sometimes there's like cleaners and stuff. And sometimes people can have like reactions to that. So usually like warm water and soap. Um, and then, or another option too, is if you don't want to like, you know, go wash things in between, you can put a condom on it. And then condom offers like a good barrier method. Then when you're done, you can take the condom off and clean it as you want or switch a condom um, while using it. So that is a good option for helping to reduce kind of spread. And then if you switch from like vaginal to anal penetration or anal to vaginal penetration, also always clean the toy or put a new condom on. If anyone uses a toy for anal simulation, make sure the toy is anal safe. It should say that, but in general, there's like a wide flared base um, because things can be like sucked up into the anal cavity. And so if that ever did happen, um, make sure that you seek medical attention to help remove that. And then if you have toys with batteries, it's a good idea to remove the batteries if it's not gonna be used for a while so that the batteries don't like leak and get all battery acidy places. So those are kind of tips for that. Again, like not the highest risk activity, but it comes from sharing. Um, you can, again, if you have any kind of sort of fluids that you swap back and forth, that's really where any risk of STIs come in. But not properly cleaning the toy does increase the risk of bacterial vaginosis. This is, again, why sometimes um, just using the condom every time helps kind of reduce that spread of bacteria. 
And then one study showed that there's an increased risk of bacterial vaginosis in women who have sex with women and share toys without proper cleaning. Um, and so among the population that they tested, 25 to 55% had BV, which is essentially like an overgrowth of bacteria. Um, so again, just options for staying safer. Okay, anal sex. So if inserting a penis, it's a great idea to use an external condoms. Um, if an external condom's not possible to use, you can use an internal condom. Dun, dun, dun. So the thing is like, there's less studies on the effectiveness of this, but again, you always want the option to protect yourself. For anal sex, there's like a little plastic ring. It recommends removing that prior to inserting and then this would just stay on the outside. Um, and then when you're done, you would just twist it and pull it out. There's some studies that say when you remove the ring, you're now messing with the material that could make it less effective, which is why in general, external condoms are always recommended. So I'm gonna put that there. Paper towels. <laughs> less than will be on your laptop. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have towels. <laughs> so again, external condoms are recommended. Um, da, 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 da. Using lubes also really important. So the anus doesn't lubricate and it also has thin skin. And so that can really increase the risk of skin tears. Anytime there's tears, there's gonna be an increased risk of bacterial infection or STI spread. So use plenty of lube to help reduce the risk. Um, there's more information on this on our website. So for time, I won't go super in depth into it, but regarding douching, technically from a medical standpoint, it's not necessarily necessary um, but some people do feel more comfortable doing that and so if someone does it's important to use water that is body temperature so like not too hot and to use a small bulb douche or an over-the-counter douche from a pharmacy or supermarket so making sure to do it correctly is important okay so anal sex has the one of the highest risks of spreading stis and again um the anus has thin kind of skin and it can be damaged easily, which makes it more vulnerable to infection. So that's why just protection is important. Um, essentially all the STIs can be spread there. And the FDA has now approved technically one condom that's actually been tested for anal sex. Um, and there's also some that are a little bit thicker now for anal sex. All external condoms like help uh, protect with anal sex, but the brand actually won spent like the, I guess you would say time and money to do testing on that for anal sex. Um, and there's also other ones that have like, they're a little bit thicker to reduce the chance of breaking. Use water-based lube with condoms or make sure you're using the right kind of lube because certain lubes can increase the risk of condoms breaking. Okay, scissoring, other forms of genital rubbing. Is everyone with me still? <laughs> I'm just cranking right along. It's a lot of information to cover in like an hour. Um, so again, anytime we are having body fluids touch or genitals touch, things like that, even without penetration, there's a risk of STIs. This is one of the harder like types of sexual activities to use a barrier method with. Some people report like using lube to hold a dental dam down in place and that that can like help reduce the risk. There's technically like, I think the company is called like Laurels. There's technically, it's like underwear with like a built-in dental dam that you could use for that. But just know like a barrier method is a little bit more challenging with this. And that's where um, STI testing may kind of be one of the better things is making sure to stay up to date on STI testing. And that can help kind of give a reduction of STI risk with this. Okay, vaginal and penile pre penetration. I was at presentation. Um, at Moorpark College, 48% of students res respondents did not use a condom for vaginal penile sex within the past 30 days. And 20% did not use any method to prevent pregnancy or STI. Um, and we have about, again, like one fifth report using withdrawal as their primary birth control method. So back to what we talked about with contraception, being on birth control does not protect against STIs. So sometimes it's important to consider if you should use a barrier method and a birth control method. Um, and then a big thing too is make sure to use the proper size condom 
Um, so if condoms are too big, semen can leak out or they can like slip off. And then if condoms are too small, they might not be comfortable or be more likely to rip. So we'll talk a little bit about condoms in a second here. Um, but also just like this isn't super common, but not all condoms are technically made for STI protection. There's sometimes like novelty condoms. So it'll say it's like a glow in the dark condom someone found and thought it was fun or something. And some of them are not always actually like meant for protection. They're meant for novelty. So just make sure if you're looking at that, that you know what it's meant for. Um, and then we talked about don't use flavored condoms for penetration because it can alter pH. Okay, so I already covered my internal condoms and external condoms, but internal condoms are another option for people. Um, maybe there was someone who won't wear an external condom and they still want to protect themselves. You can use an internal condom or again, you can use an external condom. Never use both. Why not? Anyone know? Yeah. Uh, the risk of them uh, ripping together? Yes, yeah. It increases friction and that can cause it to rip or break. So that's why, like, don't double up on condoms and don't use an internal and external condom. I think that's one of the most common questions. People are like, I want to feel really safe. So I'm going to put two condoms on. It is not recommended. Um, internal condoms, like you want to get into like, you know, sexual health equity here and, and talk hours with me. Um, so again, we talk, like condom free, maybe 36 cents. Um, these are upwards of six dollars each. So very expensive, very hard to find. I have not really found a store that sells them. Some people can get them actually just prescribed through their doctor, or you can come get some for free from us. So if that's something you want to look at, you can. So if you're gonna make water balloons, use do the 36 cents one, not the six dollar one. Okay, again, barrier methods are not 100 percent effective. Um, genital herpes, syphilis, and HPV are spread through genital skin-to-skin -skin contact. And so barrier methods don't always kind of offer 100% coverage, but they do help. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, this is like one of the last, last legs here. Condoms, any questions so far though? Good, all right. External condom facts, more trivia facts for you. Um, condoms have sizes. So there's a lot of different sizes. Most people start with kind of the regular size condom and go from there to see if it was too big or too small. Um, there's technically like the, again, that the one condom website, they have like a tool that you can like print out and it helps like measure for the size condom needed. But the big thing is that condoms shouldn't hurt. So if someone's like, oh, I don't use them because they hurt, um, it's important to check the size. It might be too small. Um, or check the ingredients to make sure that they are not like allergic to something in it. And also the amount of lube being used. You can put lube inside the condom prior to putting it on. That can make it more comfortable for some people. Um, condoms are 86% effective against preventing HIV, STIs, and pregnancy. If used correctly, they're 98% effective. So the, the discrepancy there is user error. So it's a good thing to know how to use it appropriately. Um, there's vegan condoms. There's different types of condoms. Uh, a big one is condoms do expire. So making sure that the condom's not expired, they can stretch almost three feet. So I'm like, I won't do it because I think I have sacrificed enough lube on my hand today. But you can like put it over your finger and like essentially like stretch it to your elbow. Um, and there's over 50 sizes of condoms. So if you go online and you're not finding like the size you want in stores, you can try onecondom.com. They sell over 50 sizes. Um, the stores do not have as many options. Condoms can hold nearly a gallon of liquid. Never use two condoms simultaneously. And then this is like the standard size parting that's kind of like sold in stores. Um, so again, this is like a regular. If it is too tight, someone can move up. If it is too loose, they can move down. Okay, who's ready for demo time? I need to, uh, one to two volunteers who wants to walk us through how to put a condom on. You will only slightly be judged by all your classmates. Just kidding. <laughs> It'll be super appreciated by me and I'll sweeten the deal. You can walk away with this pop it safer sex T-Rex. Yay! Woo! Anyone else? Yay! Woo! Okay, let me get let me get set up here. 
The T Rex sold it. The T Rex sold it, right? So, okay. So, you guys want do you want to go at the same time, separate time? Same time is good. Right. Okay. Go ahead and just like share out loud what you're doing and explain to the class. Oh, okay. So, take it out of the wrapper. <laughs> I don't want to. I'm going to open it again. Do you want help? Yeah. Love the communication. <laughs> there we go. Yep, yep. Okay. So then this little part that's sticking outwards yeah. will be uh, on, going onto the tip, if that makes sense. And you should pinch it a little bit. Yeah, bit. pinch it so out of the. Right, right. Beautiful it is. I have never been so proud. You roll it down. Well, yeah, you roll it down and get it like as far down as you can. can. Exactly, yeah, far down under the shop as you can. <laughs> then it might roll up if it's not all the way up. Oh. Uh, so, um, please help yourself to the color T Rex. Oh, thank you. I even so um, good job. Yeah, you can have a choice of stickers as well. I will take a paper towel. <laughs> oh, that's fair. Same. Okay. All right. Woohoo! <laughs> um, what do we think? Did they did they do a good job? Any anything you would just add to the wonderful communication? I will say that great teamwork. Any little anything else? Good, good, good. All right, we'll just review the steps and check. So the, there was just two pre-steps that almost everyone misses. Um, these condoms were expired. So first thing is to check the expiration date. It's a trick condom, I'm sorry. Um, so these ones expired in 2023, but that's why we use them for a teaching demo. Um, and then the other thing to do is just check that there's an air pocket. Why would we do that? Yeah. Make sure someone has some, like, stuff to put in there. Yeah, there's no holes in it. Um, yeah, so that's the thing. So overall, though, really, really good job. Those are just the two little things that I always like to tell students to add. So check the expiration date first. This one's printed in, like, black writing on, like, very dark paper. So not easy to see. Check for the air pocket. Make sure the wrapper's also not all, like, crunchy and degraded from, like, being stored in a hot car or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then everything else was perfectly done. You pinch the tip. Why do we pinch the tip? Yeah. For that breaking? So it's like a semen reservoir. Yeah. So it gives somewhere for the semen to go. Um, and then you did a wonderful job making sure that it was the right direction too. Sometimes people like try to put it on the other way and then they like are struggling to roll it down. It shouldn't roll that way. So it should go the way it rolls. You both did a great job showing that. Um, and then rolling it all the way down. That was well done. So that those all those little things help it to become closer to that 98% effective. So another round of applause. Good sports, good sports. And that's just something too. Don't store condoms like in a purse where it can get poked, in a hot car, in like a wallet. Those are not the safe places to store it. We have little tin boxes if you do want to stop by my office. Um, and that's like a great place to store dental dams, condoms, internal condoms, all that. Okay. Back to fun things like STIs. <laughs> so with vaginal and penile sex, the risk of passing an STI is high. Um, it, it, someone does not have to like ejaculate or finish to pass an STI. It can be passed um, without full penetration or without ejaculation. So anytime there's like pre-ejaculation fluid or any like fluid that can pass an STI as well as skin to skin contact for the ones we talked about. And then just back to quickly the demo on the internal condom. So a lot of people haven't seen this before. So again, you just take it out of the pouch. You pinch that little like, like rubber circle that was in it. This insert it, leave this on the outside. When you're done, you just twist it and pull it out. Um, don't ever flush condoms, internal condoms or external condoms. It can cause like major like backup in the plumbing, things like that. So don't flush them. 
throw them away. I know a lot of times I've talked to students are like, well, I just don't trust it. I want to flush it. It's not my house. It's not my problem. Um, it will be someone's problem. <laughs> so you can wrap it in like toilet paper, tissue, anything like that. And then kind of we're just want to wrap up on, we talked about STIs, we talked about barrier methods, but as mentioned before, right, communication is huge. It's good if you have your own kind of like personal plan before maybe having sex. So like, what are your boundaries? Do you want your partner or partners to be STI tested? Do you want to be STI tested? Um, so thinking about what you want and knowing that like you have a right to like ask for that and have that conversation. Um, so we have lots of different tips and things online, but you can talk about that, you know, you're excited to explore, but you want to get STI tested first, or that maybe you're like, yeah, I know we can't get pregnant, but I still want to talk about, you know, how we're keeping each other safe. Um, or you share what you're doing and you ask what your partner or partners are planning to do to stay safe. So just kind of brainstorming out the way to have those conversations can help in the moment. Um, and that kind of helps give autonomy over your sexual experiences and how you feel about them. And I know power dynamics can be tricky, culture can be tricky, all of those things. So just kind of doing that practice and finding that way to be your own best advocate for that. Um, with that, can I just briefly show you where you can get more great resources from our student health website? We still have a few minutes, right? Okay, I'm gonna try not to break anything on this. Do -do -do -do. And you can think of great questions while I do this. Okay, so the Moore Park College Student Health Center, if you just Google us, we're the first hit. Um, dun, dun, dun. So our general student health center page has lots of information for you. And I just want to kind of show you a couple areas that relate to STIs and sexual health. If it loads... You're all, when I show you these stickers, you're going to wish you can remember this. Look at sexual equality. Come on now. <laughs> Talk about boundaries. Taco. These are all this brain right here. <laughs> Safer sex T Rex. If you, so the health center is like through the admin building, right? Room 111. I'm like, if you ever want to come get any more of this fun stuff here, um, I'm right around the corner and room 126 so mine's the door like in between the bulletin boards with all the stickers on it so you'll find me okay loaded so here's our general health center website it covers our hours it showed like well if it loaded it would show you our services available um dun 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 yeah i mean i'm pretty good staller like i shared about my stickers um, this is going to show you the alt text for this, but I will just draw your attention to the right hand side. So here are all the links. If you're interested, maybe in even speaking with one of our mental health providers about like setting boundaries or sexual health in general, all of that, we have a full mental health team and students get access to them, uh, up to six free sessions a semester. We have information on things like eye exam and glasses, if you would like free resources for that. We have mental health self-screening and resources, mindfulness. And then the two that I really kind of want to show us is safe zone and sexual health. And then we also though have like social wellness, which is like kind of just classroom tips, like even how to email a professor, like how to do group projects, how to deal with difficult people. I'm sure none of us have ever had to deal with. Um, and then our general wellness is there as well. So all of that's available to you online and it's updated frequently, but I'll take you to our sexual health website. Dun, dun, dun. So you can always walk into the student health center and grab a bag of free external condoms. And then, like I said, um, I am the keeper of all the other things in my office. So my overwhelming office, if you walk in, everyone's like, is this a, like a storage closet? And I'm like, no, I'm sitting in the middle of it. Um, that's my office. And that's where the dental dams and internal condoms are kept. So stop by if you want any of that or ask our front desk and they can grab some for you. But we have STI testing, pregnancy testing, pap test, birth control, emergency contraception, and all of that. And then we have this super cool PDF book that there's like a 
series two of this now. So I just have to make it accessible and that'll be out uploaded online as well. Well, this loads. Any questions from the presentation? Anything we want to chat about? No, you just want the Wi-Fi to work so you can all get out of here. I hear you. <laughs> Well, that loads, I'll take you back to the website that's working. So that includes like things on sexual orientation, gender. Um, it has a lot on like consent and how to have conversations. It talks about what healthy relationships look like. It covers everything for safer sex practices that we just covered and more. It talks about barrier methods and it goes more in depth to STIs. And then we also have like other resources. So we have like a list of LGBTQ plus specific sexual health resources. So you can open these up and it has good information there. Um, and then some of our brochures are getting loaded here. So we have like sexual health and dating brochures, like how to have combos, dating, who pays? You could ask that question a lot, like in outreach, um, types of barrier methods, all that good stuff. See, this is like 50% there. Dun, 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 dun. I'll start showing you what else is in my goodie bag while that loads. So on your way out to, oh, I'll do my, what my other public service now. Lavender graduations next Friday. Technically, the RSVP date has passed, but since I am the controller of the RSVPs, I thought I would bring it by one more time. Um, if you're interested, lavender graduations for LGBTQI plus students and allies, you don't have to be graduating to attend. It's super, super fun. There's like, a pre-party with food and then a ceremony and then a post-party with dancing and more food. Um, we're going to have like makerspace there. It's going to be a lot of cool things. So I'll leave this QR code out. Um, if you, if you are CP today, I will, I'll add it to the list. Um, and then I also will pass these around as that loads. If you want to just pass them around. This is our health center information card. Just that way, we'll move them this way. Um, so that covers our services. If you have any questions, I was call. And then I will leave these out as well if anyone's interested in like reading material. Look at that. <laughs> um, uh, so there's a lot you could go through here. If you, I'll put some of them out, but let me just move, take my penises back, <laughs> take my trash. And then because I know like not everyone else wants to go ask, and I mean, look how cool I am. Why wouldn't you want to come talk to me? But I did bring some of the internal condoms and dental dams. If anyone just wants to like see it, see what they look like, take some, take some home, save them for a rainy day, whatever. Um, I will leave those out. The external condoms, you just walk in to grab from the student health center. So they're just right there. But whoa, it loaded. <laughs> Look at that. So again, I just wanted to show you this resource is available online and it is accessible. So it covers a lot of different things, but the consent one. So this is the video I talked about. It's a 10 minute TED talk that was super great on consent. Just scan that QR code um, or you can Google this one, the, the name of it, and it'll pop right up. It's a really good video and I think it like you can share with me what you thought of it um but there's also other like tips on consent how to start conversations all of that oh the, the new analogy sex is shouldn't be about baseball think about it like pizza I'll leave that cliffhanger for you to go look more into um and then it covers all these tips because I talk fast and we covered a lot and once you get past gonorrhea it's easy to tune out so all of that's available online for your leisure <laughs> so yep how to use an external condom more facts about it so all right questions before i pass it back over to your instructor yeah did you call it quality because quality chlamydia it's like a, it has that double play on it they do have chlamydia but it also i just most of my outreach includes an animal of some sort, an equality, but they do get chlamydia, so that's good. It's a good double there. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. Can pulse source only be passed if like if someone like actually like has a pulse source? 
So that's like the highest risk of transmission is like when someone actively has an open sore. Yeah. Yeah, that's like puts at the highest risk. I'll just keep scrolling slowly as people. I just want to make sure you're all like intrigued and want to go back. <laughs> Any other final questions? Well, thank you so much for your time. I know it's like, a, it's a lot to cover and it's a big topic. So I'll hang around for a minute. If anyone wants to ask me anything, stop by my office anytime and I'll turn it back over. Thank you. It's not there, but please again, don't forget to put the hand and uh, yeah, Mr. will hang out for a little bit if you do have any questions. Otherwise, I'll see you all on. Yeah, that was awesome. I was like, thank you. It's never fun to have a little bit of a So they came to this presentation, I was like, in the bathroom washing my hands.